Hello, and welcome back to the Physique Development Podcast. In today's episode, we're going to be going all over sleep supplementation. But if you haven't listened to episode 97, you might want to go ahead and listen to that one first. We talk about everything that's needed to have the best night of sleep ever, which I know we could all use. So we talked about some supplementation at the end, but we wanted to expand on that a little bit more and be able to give you guys some insight. So Alex, do you want to go ahead and dive on into some sleep supplementation? Sure. I think that the really the first thing that we want to drive home here before we get into supplementation is really nailing down lifestyle factors. Because if we just solely look at supplementation, we're going to be in a situation if we're just neglecting the lifestyle components that these supplements can be helpful, but without the lifestyle factors, we're not going to have the same level of benefit. Mm -hmm. And so if you are in a situation where you're neglecting the lifestyle aspects and then only having the supplementation, it's kind of missing the forest for the trees type scenario. And so ensure that all the lifestyle components are in place before you really dig in to what we're about to speak on today. And today is going to be an episode in which it is going to be a fantastic idea to have a pen and paper and be taking notes alongside the episode because we have a lot of research that we dug into for this episode as well as a lot of helpful pieces for you. Now, when we look at sleep and and individuals um, that struggle with sleep, about 68% of Americans report that they have one night of sleep that is not good. So they struggle at least one out of seven nights a week with their sleep. That is very significant. And I think the lifestyle factors play the largest role, but this supplementation is going to help as well. Now, with the quality of your sleep, you want to assess where that's at for you. You may be in a situation where your lifestyle factors are great, and this supplementation may take your sleep to another level, or it may be null and void because your sleep is in a great spot. And that's okay. That's I, I wish that yeah. my sleep was that good. And I, I think that when we look at sleep as a whole, what are some of the things that you have struggled with in your sleep that would be helpful for you? Because I don't want to get into this episode and have you as the listener feel as though that I sleep perfectly every single night. <laughs> like a lot of the research, a lot of the things that we're going to talk about today are coming from personal experience, things that we've applied with our clients that have been tremendously helpful. And I certainly don't want you to be listening and be like, they're, they're perfect. They're sleep, they sleep perfect every, you know, all seven nights of the week. I know if you want to think I'm perfect, you can, but <laughs> I definitely am not. And I would say something that I'm even struggling with sleep right this moment is that I am, I might, there's a shift in my schedule and I thought I had things in a good spot, but then it ended up of a few too many nights staying up too late and trying to break the cycle of still getting up at the same time, oversleeping my alarm, feeling a little bit discombobulated in the morning, not getting all of my work done. And then again, my work going too late. And then I end up eating too late too before I go to sleep. So currently I'm really putting a concerted effort towards finishing my food early in the day because that makes a huge impact for me. Like I can do everything else right. And if I eat a meal too close to bed, then that can change everything. Um, so eating my meals earlier and then getting to bed the time that I told myself I was going to get to bed because what I realized, I, I literally had like a light bulb moment this morning because I woke up like at the time of my alarm, which felt like there was a few days that I just kept like grabbing my phone and just for a little bit longer staying in bed. And I realized one of the reasons I love getting up is Alex and I's most productive hours are in the morning. So that's one reason. But I also love being able to go on my morning walk with the dogs. And I love being able to kind of have a break to go ahead and make breakfast. So even though I am still doing stuff of making a meal, it's nice to break up my work day if I have this huge chunk at the beginning of the day. And then I get this walk, I get to enjoy myself making breakfast, either listening to music or watching something while I'm making breakfast. And that is something I like to be able to take my time and not be in a rush and truly enjoy. And when I wake up late, that not only pushes my day backwards, but I don't get that solid block of work in the morning. So I don't feel as accomplished and good. And then I feel rushed going through the thing I want to enjoy. So it starts off my day on not the best note, but a lot of it could just be solved by 
like being aware of what time I'm eating and being aware of what time I'm going to sleep. Right. And, and the one thing that I run into the most personally within my sleep, um, mine is stress related. Mm -hmm. Like my, my sleep can be very hindered by stress and, and carrying what happened throughout the day into my evening and letting that kind of sit on my mind. The other thing is, is consuming caffeine too close to bed. Um, and so from a research standpoint, we want to have the final caffeine consumption roughly eight to 10 hours before we plan to go to sleep. And so 2 p.m. noon uh, would be the last time that you would want to consume caffeine. And I know this is, you know, like I said, this is where I run into issues is that I'm cranking through my day. I hit maybe two or three o'clock and I'm starting to get a little bit more drowsy. I may you know, grab a coffee real quick and have caffeine knowing in that moment that it's going to hinder my sleep, but mm -hmm. I'm like prioritizing getting the thing done that I have to get done at that moment. And sometimes there are situations yeah. that that is the case, but more often than not, you should prioritize your sleep over getting a little bit, you know, whatever else the thing is that you're trying to get done. Because if you prioritize your sleep to begin with, you might've had better energy to go about doing those things. And sometimes you just have to eat shit, so to speak, of I put myself in this situation. I don't get caffeine at this point, even though it would help me because I need to help myself of getting to sleep, even if I'm going to be tired. Like I kind of did that to myself. Right. Um, and I want to say like not just caffeine, but stimulants in general. So for myself, I had to really figure out when was going to be the best time to take my medication, which has a stimulant in it. And it's really important to figure that out for yourself. So again, you're not taking that too late in the day and that causing you to be up late later as well. So just something to be aware of when we're talking about caffeine, also throwing stimulants in there just to be aware of. Right. And, and, and you know, the thing that we talked about, I believe in the last episode is that sleep is going to be the be best cognitive enhancement drug that we can have mm -hmm. by maximizing our sleep is the most uh, important thing that we can do for our brain because just a few nights of bad sleep is going to lead to um, mood dysregulation, cognitive clarity and performance declining mental health issues, physical performance declining, as well as hormonal function as well. And so a lot of, I mean, literally it is impacting <laughs> everything that is going on from a day-to-day -day standpoint. And when we look at supplementation, we have things that are going to be um, naturally occurring within the body, but also things that are going to be acting upon the body to have better secretion of some of those different hormones. And so when we look at the most important, now with what would you say is the most important supplement if there was to be one within your sleep. Mm. I hope you get this right because it's the first one that we're talking about. Well, I was going to say magnesium. Okay, excellent. You got it right. <laughs> magnesium is ding, the most ding, important. Ding, ding. <laughs> and I'm going to give you guys a little bit of, of insight you on know, magnesium. Don't you hate it when someone asks you a question and they have a perceived answer that they want you to have? And the way they phrase the question, you're just kind of like, oh, crap, I know that they have something very specific they want me to answer, but I might just Listen, crash and burn. We're married. We have telepathic we have telepathic I wish. communication. I literally, I was, I, I gave wish. you that answer right from here. I, I wish that we had that. <laughs> There's a book that they can do that. They like, since they're soulmates or since they're like mated, they can speak to each other. And I'm like, that would be the best thing ever. We would not have to have our phones really ever. It would be incredible. And I would just, it would be the best. I can't believe they wrote a book on us. Um, all right. <laughs> so magnesium is an essential dietary mineral and is the second most prevalent intracellular cation. Now a cation, it's not necessary for us to talk about right now. It's just an ion with a positive charge. <laughs> And within this, it also serves as a cofactor for over 600 enzymes in the body. Most notably, magnesium is required for energy production, carbohydrate metabolism, and DNA and protein synthesis, as well as improving your sleep. <laughs> <laughs> it does a lot of things for you. It does a lot of things. And it, and it, it is an antagonist of calcium in the body and is required for vitamin D synthesis. Now, we're going to talk later on vitamin D and how it impacts your sleep positively, but keep that in your notes to remember when we dig into that because it is a, a very important piece. Magnesium deficiency is going to inhibit and potentially remove or decline the benefits of that vitamin D as well. So again, very, very important. Where you can find magnesium within your food is going to be within uh, leafy greens, nuts, seeds, legumes, and whole grains. Now, within that, you're not going to have oftentimes, 
a significant an enough amount for you as an individual, just from the foods, unless you're consuming a ton of those things throughout the day, which kudos to you if you're consuming those whole foods all throughout the day, you're awesome. Uh, but I know that for myself and, and I know for my clients, it's not normally sufficient enough just from the whole foods. Yeah. And I think that being able to reflect on your diet, because when we look at like the average West, Western diet, not only is it high in omega-6 fatty acids, but then it is low in magnesium and other nutrients that you need. So if you're not eating a lot of whole foods, which isn't the end of the world, again, we need to put in context what's important for each person. But having that supplement in place can be helpful, where when we say supplement, obviously it's not a substitute, but we do need to be able to look at the context of where it's coming from and where I might need that in place. And I take magnesium every single day, multiple times a day. And I don't think of myself or my body less because it isn't producing enough for me. Because we also need to think about how the world has changed to a certain degree of when we look at magnesium, it's something that most adults are already deficient in. And then it's easily depleted from stress. And so stress can be stress of training. So if you are someone who trains regularly and not supplementing with magnesium, then I would recommend looking into it of being able to start with that. Um, but it's also going to be, again, stress in general. So lack of sleep can cause stress as well as anything within work and then the world that we're in. And so being able to recognize that that's being depleted and something that you're already deficient in. And then if your diet isn't supporting that, then you can help yourself of, hey, I'm going to go ahead and put a supplement in place. And that's how we really like to look at it when it comes to supplements of it's not, oh, I just, I'm going to take take all of these so I don't have to eat whole foods or I don't have to do X, Y, and Z. It's really looking at how does this apply to the context of your life and the situation? And can we go ahead and help ourselves out? Right. And you may be thinking right now, all right, Alex and Sue, you guys have convinced me I'm going to use magnesium, whether it be just for my sleep or just for my, my health needs. You go to your local GNC, you go to your local vitamin shop, you find the magnesium. There's like 50 different types. <laughs> There's so many different types of magnesium and you're wondering, okay, well, they just said magnesium, so I'm just gonna grab one of these and that's not what you should do because I have two different forms that I think are going to be the best for you from a sleep standpoint. Now, we have been on multiple occasions, pull up the receipts, magnesium <laughs> glycinate is our absolute favorite. Magnesium glycinate is shown to be the best absorption form of magnesium, as well as it being paired with that uh, glycinate component. It's paired with glycine, which is going to be another uh, amino acid that we're going to speak on here in a little bit that is going to enhance your sleep. And so that form is very, very good. Generally, we're going to recommend 200 to 400 milligrams of consumption, maybe 60 minutes before bed could be a good time, but you can supplement through it with it throughout the day. It is going to build up in your system. So it's not something that is going to act as an immediate sedative. So having it in your routine throughout the day is going to be the most important part, but having it at that 60 minute marker is going to be advantageous as well. Mm -hmm. a, another form that is going to be advantageous is going to be magnesium L3 and eight, th three and eight. Mm -hmm. Now this is a newer one. This is, this is a, a developing body of research around this form of magnesium. This is going to be a type of magnesium that has an easier time breaking that blood brain barrier and is easily absorbed to the brain. And so the research itself is going to um, indicate that it helps with sleep. It, it helps with um, anxiety and, and cognitive dysfunction. It is going to have um, aspects in which it can reverse the aging process of the brain, which I think that all of us can mm -hmm. agree is, is something that we all want to have. I would like for my brain to stay as young and fresh <laughs> as ever. Now with, with three and eight, it is one that it is not recommended if you are experiencing magnesium deficiency. So we talked about earlier of the different factors that magnesium is going to play a role in within the muscular contractions and those different things. So if you're experiencing deficiencies in that, three and eight is not going to be the answer for you. Now, for us, glycinate is something that I may use throughout the day, but three and eight is something I would use in the evening because it is going to have a more direct impact to my sleep, whereas gly magnesium glycinate may have a more global effect on me just being a more relaxed individual. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to, to add that in there. 
some of the forms that when you're looking on that shelf at GNC or vitamin shop and you've got 15 different types of magnesium, these are the ones that I want you to avoid because they're not going to have the same effect that we're speaking on today. Uh, hydroxide, oxide, and citrate. These three are going to work more as laxatives. So if you're having GI distress or you're having any form of constipation and are needing that laxative benefit, these forms will be good for you. But if you're planning on, <laughs> it's time for me to go to sleep and you take these and you think that it's going to allow for you to get in a restful state and go to bed, it may actually be doing the opposite because <laughs> you may be waking up in the middle of the night with a little bit of a, um, a waddle to the bathroom <laughs> for a, a diarrhea experience. So <laughs> a diarrhea that experience. That was extremely uh, forthcoming and <laughs> I meant every word of it. <laughs> uh, and I think it's important with us talking about these for you guys to see that these aren't all, like Alex said, a sedative. And it's not like, oh, this is going to immediately make me sleepy. It's looking at things that can support you as you go to sleep. So it's not just, hey, let's take a tranquilizer and knock ourselves out. We can just really support the processes in our body to make sure that we can have more sleep. Correct. And so I wanted to give you guys just a... a um, recap for the dosages is that for the magnesium glycinate, 200 to 400 milligrams will be good. Anecdotally for myself, I have titrated this up to two grams daily just to see if there was any GI distress that came with it or any adverse effects that um, I experienced. And I didn't experience anything, but I, I also don't think that there was, you know, uh, greater returns by going that high. I think that it was just like null and void. So 200 to 400 will be good. And then the three and eight is going to be 140 to 150 milligrams. Most of, uh, like if you go and purchase the, the brand that we have is life extension. And I think it's 145 milligrams, uh, per capsule or per serving for that. The second, second favorite or, or, or second one that I would personally add in mm -hmm. is going to be theanine. Theanine is fantastic. Um, theanine is is going to have um, a, a lot of benefits as a whole. It is a naturally occurring non-protein amino acid found in tea that promotes relaxation by reducing stress and anxiety levels. Now, L-theanine is not going to be a sedative. And when I say that, you guys may be turning around your energy drink right now and seeing that theanine is on your, or is in your energy drink as well. And there are different components within theanine or, or benefits, I should say, um, that you may experience. And that is going to allow for caffeine to be able to, or I guess, remove the anxiousness that you may experience with caffeine. So if you overconsume caffeine, it could be useful for you to have 100, 200, 300 milligrams of theanine to kind of offset some of that mm -hmm. jitteriness or anxiousness as well. So it's a useful tool in, in multiple different aspects of your day. And so this is one that I find a lot of benefit in. What do you experience within your clients that utilize theanine? Is this one that you often recommend? Yeah, it is. And it's one that kind of takes the edge off when, especially with you talking about caffeine of you might have this anxiety that's creeping up and you might feel uh, that jitter, but it kind of just takes the edge off and allows you to have that clear focus when it comes to your energy with that caffeine. But I actually first started using it before using it with caffeine. Um, and a lot of pre-workouts also have theanine in them to help with that caffeine. Um, but I always used it when it came to sleep and more just anxiety in general. If I felt myself getting too revved up in the day and just needing to take a beat for myself, then being able to have that theanine was helpful because it also goes across that blood brain barrier. Um, and it just allowed me to get in a more relaxed state as a whole. So I really like it of when I need to just calm my brain down and get it of like, hey, we're, we're, we're bringing it down a little bit, um, then I really like being able to have theanine in place. And as we talked about in last episode, I normally recommend theanine and or taurine if someone is having something where they are training close to bed or they're in a state where they're working really close up until bed, where they might need something to help them as quick as possible calm down because they might not be able to have like 30 minutes to an hour or two hours to calm down before bed. They might have to get right to bed. And so again, and we need to look at the context and say, hey, since we can't change this in your day, let's see if we can help it a little bit. Right. And coming back to that crossing the blood brain barrier, um, it is going to increase serotonin, dopamine and GABA levels in the brain. So a lot of really positive components and, and even to, to further those positive uh, aspects is that it is a remarkably has very remarkably low toxicity. Um, within theanine, it has been shown within uh, some rodent studies that 
even taking up to 4,000 milligrams per kilogram of body weight oh my gosh, daily that's so for 13 much. weeks. Let me repeat that. This is, <laughs> this is wild. In, a, in one rodent study, they found that there was no toxic effect when taking 4,000 milligrams of theanine per kilogram <laughs> per kilogram of body weight daily for 13 weeks. I mean, you're talking 97 days. Oh my These, gosh. Uh, rodents were taking, I can't even imagine how many kilograms is a normal rodent. Well, just even if it was just 4,000 milligrams a day, I was like, oh, that's a lot. I know. But per kilogram of body weight, that is so much theanine. Ridiculous. Ridiculous. Now, good thing theanine is very price efficient because exactly. uh, that would be quite pricey if not. Exactly. And one thing that I, I wanted to add within theanine is that I was, I had a client, this is a kind of a client example here where, um, she had she had all the lifestyle factors in place and was doing a great job of her nighttime routine. And we had we had magnesium, we had theanine in there, um, but she was having a, a situation where she was waking in the middle of the night, and I could not pinpoint why this was happening. It was driving me insane, and so then I got sucked down a rabbit hole. And had found, as I went through each of the supplements and trying to find research that would be connecting to uh, those vivid dreams that were making her wake, um, and theanine actually was part of that. Mm -hmm. And so then once we pulled out the theanine, she was getting the same quality of sleep and was no longer experiencing the, the waking in the middle of the night. So if you are someone who is supplementing with theanine and you're like, man, I don't know why I'm waking up from these extremely vivid dreams, pull it out for maybe a week and see what the difference is, um, because that could be a kind of a, I don't know, I don't want to call it a silent killer because that's like, <laughs> that's like too strong. It's just like a, a side effect, yeah. so to speak. And we'll, we'll talk about this at the end of talking about how to implement these different supplements. And especially if you don't have any of them in play um, to make sure that if something like that happens, you can figure out what it is sooner and be able to have more of an understanding. So we'll get into that as far as how to go about implementing these and what to look for when you are implementing them as well. Are you wanting to hire the last coach you will ever need? Well, look no further. Physique Development is here to help you. We have a huge emphasis on knowledge and communication and making sure you know how to get yourself in the best position so you never have to hire another coach again. If this sounds great to you, then go ahead and fill out the inquiry link in the show notes or the description box, and we would love to get on a call with you. Right. And so now that we've crossed the the first two, probably my the first two that I would personally implement. Mm -hmm. Now we're moving to what I believe to be my third favorite, which is going to be glycine. Glycine, as we talked about within that magnesium glycinate, is going to be an amino acid with a number uh, of important functions in the body. It acts as a, tran a neurotransmitter, a, a component, a very important component of collagen. It is a precursor to various biomolecules such as creatine, and, and glycine is going to be considered a conditional essential, uh, is conditionally essential, and it can generally be produced in the body um, in sufficient amounts. So this could be something that's not necessary, potentially, for you to um, have to supplement with it, mm -hmm. but I would recommend supplementing with it because it is going to have quality benefits from a rest and relaxation standpoint and especially in individuals and, and the research is very supporting of this is that individuals that are pregnant glycine has shown great effects in terms of improving overall sleep yeah i think glycine um one thing that we kind of talked about and is again helpful when we're looking at what different things to be aware of when implementing is glycine can lower your core body temperature which we also talked about last week of it's really helpful to have it be colder in the room with going to sleep. And we do want that to a certain degree, um, but we also want to be aware of if you are feeling a little bit too chilly of that could be an aspect of it. So being able to truly understand the supplements you're putting in and not just taking it because we told you to or we said it was a good supplement of really looking at how does this apply to me and my lifestyle as well as am I aware of what to look for or pay attention to as I'm taking this so I'm really getting the benefit of it. Right. 
And we talked about the the serotonin component um, within the theanine and it being, or theanine being able to upregulate serotonin levels in the brain. And glycine is going to have a very similar effect. Now, serotonin is that that feel good hormone that makes you feel kind of cozy and cuddly, mm-hmm. and you're just kind of like, I feel good. <laughs> uh, that hormone it it, it elevates uh, mood, it, it improves overall sleep, and um, by getting better sleep, it's kind of like a it's a snowball effect. By being able to get better sleep, your mood's going to improve your um, memory and, and your ability of just cognitive function is going to improve. So a lot of these supplements are going to be in alignment with the same benefits because they're enhancing the strongest thing. And we come back to that same point of the best cognitive enhancement that you can have is going to be optimizing your sleep. And so these things are going to be enhancing that um, if taken properly. Yeah. So that is with glycine. Now, glycine is going to be from a dosing standpoint, three to five grams. So you're going to have, it's a little bit of a a greater dosage. You are going to find this in many of your protein sources as a whole. So you are going to get a a decent bit throughout your food. Again, it's, it's one of those situations where yes, you're going to be getting it from your food, but it's not going to be a detriment to you to also have it within your nighttime supplementation. And I find it to be very beneficial. It's one for me that is, uh, tremendously helpful because mm-hmm. I do run hot at night yes. more often than not. Even you run with hot us, in general. <laughs> more often than not, even with us having the uh, temperature in the house at 68 degrees, uh, we have a fan and those different aspects, I still can run hot. So glycine is, is tremendously helpful. Mm-hmm. The next one. So the, these next handful, these three are kind of like... Um, I thought that they would be useful to speak on from a research standpoint. These are not three that I personally use. For my nighttime stack, I have the glycine, I have the theanine, and I have the magnesium. Those are the three that I personally use, but I do believe that the research on these next three is good and and worth noting, as well as I've got, I say only the next three, and I've got like a list of honorable mentions as well as (laughs) some vitamins that I think are important. So when we look at the next one is, is apigenin. Now, with apigenin, this is going to have a positive effect on reducing overall anxiety and causing a sedation, causing sedation. So the last three that we just talked about are not going to have sedative properties. Am I saying that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. Saying that correct. There we go. Mm -hmm. Um, This one is going to have a greater sedative uh, effect to it. So when you are supplementing with those other three, it's not going to be a must that you take them before bed. Um, But I would say if you're taking the apigenin, it is going to be something that I highly recommend to only consume before bed and and certainly not operating heavy machinery, vehicles, all that fun stuff. (laughs) I guess cars fall into that heavy machinery category. Uh, But within this, it is going to bind to receptors in the brain that will trigger muscle relaxation and that sedation effect. It is also going to allow for us to decrease overall cortisol. So this is another big one that we want to be cognizant of is that cortisol, we have we get a lot of it in the morning and we want to see that kind of decrease as the day goes on so that we have the aspect in which we're able to fall asleep because cortisol is going to um, engage like uh, adrenaline and just more of your fight or flight senses as a whole. Mm-hmm. So we want to see that lower as we're going to bed. And so having the apigenin in is going to be tremendously helpful. Now it can be found in foods as we've talked about many a times within all these supplements and the chamomile is probably going to be the easiest way for you to get this. So like a chamomile tea is going to be a way that you could get um, a good bit of this. You're also going to get it from uh, parsley and and celery and spinach and artichokes and oregano. Um, and the the best way to get though get the apigenin is from the dried form of those different foods. So just keeping that in mind, if you're trying to do this the most holistic way or not wanting to take capsules, you're not wanting to go out and buy supplements, you're wanting to do it through whole foods. I wanted to make a note of all all this so that you had the opportunity to know what foods to try to incorporate more into your diet to get these um, ingredients or um, these benefits, if you will, mm-hmm. from it without having to take the supplements. Now, from a dosing standpoint, that's where you run into a little bit of the issues if you're trying to consume it from whole foods or through uh, chamomile tea, for example, because you want to have between 50 and 100 milligrams to um 
have the effects that we're speaking on from a sedation standpoint. And so with the foods, you're just not 100% certain that you're going to be able to get to that level unless you're consuming a lot of it. Yeah, and tracking it all. But I will say that an app that you can use if you're needing to track some different vitamins and minerals in your body and you are trying to get them from foods or just see where your baseline is with foods is an app called Chronometer. And you can track your food in there similar to my fitness pal, but it gives you the whole breakdown of those vitamins and minerals so you're able to see what you're getting naturally through food. So if you are interested in it, then that's a great one to check out. Excellent. The next one is going to be GABA. GABA is something that we've already spoken about. It's a neurotransmitter um, that has a sedative and calming effect. Now, when we talk about GABA supplementation, this is going to be something that is a little, it still needs more work from a, a research standpoint because a lot of the early research surrounding GABA was trying to elicit a greater growth hormone response. And so with the focus being there, it wasn't as uh, focused on improving the overall quality of the sleep. Now, what they have found from research is that the oral consumption does not have a good enough quantity that crosses the blood-brain barrier that is going to allow for it to be the, the, the sh- enough of the strength for it to act upon and have those sedative effects. So with that being said, I do think that there are, or not that I think, I know that there are other locations of receptors for GABA. And one of those main places is going to be on the lymphocytes. Now, if we have an understanding of the lymphatic system, the lymphatic system is kind of like your body's highway and it's it's there's there's spots of of greater density of the lymph nodes and so in my thought process, at least, now the, the body of research still needs to, to continue here. So this is my opinion and, and my thoughts after consuming the research and, and those different factors is that I would imagine with the multiple GABA receptors that are throughout the body in the pancreas, uh, on the lymphocytes, um, and those different factors, that there would be some form of relaxation and sedative effect on those receptors um, directly rather than it having to cross the, the blood-brain barrier. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, from a research standpoint, that is not conclusive. That is my opinion and what I would believe to be the case. Um, I think that it's a, a viable option. I've had success with utilizing GABA. Um, it's you know, 100 to 200 milligrams is going to be a good place for you to start within your GABA supplementation. If you dig into the research, again, it's going to come back to trying to elicit a greater growth hormone response. And so that GABA um, dosage that they utilize within that research is going to be like, I think, four to five grams. So that's not going to be a direct representation of trying to enhance your sleep. This is kind of one of those supplements that's you could add it into your uh, stack, if you will. But I'm not so sure that you're going to get a ton of effect if you're just taking it by itself. Like, mm-hmm. I think that it could be useful in a full, uh, like a full uh a supplement that's created for sleep. I think it could be a useful tool, but I'm not so sure that by itself, it's going to be a game changer for you by any means. Yeah, I agree with that. Now we will go on to melatonin, which I know that we mentioned in the last episode and I mentioned a little bit earlier in this episode and really referenced it possibly in a bad light, but more so looking at chronic use being in a bad light. Because when we look at melatonin, it's a hormone. So any hormone that you're putting into your body, you need to be pretty careful with what you're doing and aware of what impact it's going to be. So you might see all these sleep gummies and they have melatonin and oh, I should just take these every single night. But But being able to recognize you're putting a hormone in place and your body naturally produces it. And so we want to be aware of how much we're putting in, how frequently we're putting in to not throw off our body's ability to produce it. And with that, the the research is very back and forth on if it is shutting off natural secretion or if it is not. Now, I've always been of the train of thought that I'm with you in the sense that I would believe that if we're, if we are orally consuming this, what it acts as a hormone in our body, that the natural secretion would at some point turn off and become dependent on what we're consuming. Mm -hmm. It only makes logical sense, but the research and the body of research is not overly conclusive on that yet. And so 
uh, we would recommend to take as little as needed because we're we're thinking of it in the sense of using it as a kickstarter to your natural secretion or getting back into alignment if you're a shift worker or you're experiencing some form of jet lag. Mm-hmm. So with those those uh, in that context, utilizing it to trigger a secretion of the natural um, or the natural secretion of that hormone um, being in place. And so utilizing it in that context, I believe it to be the best option there. It's going to help with your ability to fall asleep. Now with melatonin, and this may be something that you as the listener have run into when you've utilized melatonin is that it does help you fall asleep, but does not help you retain that sleep. You're going to have moments of, of waking up in the middle of the night and being like, well, I'm still, I'm still not having great sleep. And so one thing that I, if that's you and and you're in that situation, what I would recommend to you is, is looking at magnesium first. If you're not taking any magnesium and you're wanting to stick with the melatonin, you're like, I like the melatonin. I feel good with having it in place. Awesome. Good for you. I'm glad that you found something that works for you. If, if, if you are waking up in the middle of the night, take that magnesium, not when you wake up, but before you go to bed and see if that offsets things. I think that would be the first place that I would start and making sure that your um, magnesium stores are sufficient and then seeing how things go from there. Yeah. So that wraps up the main bulk, but we do have some honorable mentions, like Alex said, um, of some other supplements and just some other vitamins that are either going to help these supplements or just help you in general of your body running more optimally to be able to fulfill the processes that we're talking about. Yeah. So the the first or really the, the main honorable mention that I wanted to make, I know that um, we have an incredible opportunity to work with many women, uh, women who have desires to be pregnant, have desires to um, be a mother in the future, who are currently pregnant, who have been pregnant before and wanting to get pregnant again. And so a lot of my research that, that it, we do on a regular basis is centered around that because we're wanting to facilitate the greatest environment for our clients, of course. And so one that honorable mention is myo inositol. Now, myo inositol aids in improving sleep quality, subjective sleep quality, and sleep duration during pregnancy. It is often utilized, and you may be more familiar with it, in restoring insulin sensitivity as well as managing PCOS in women. In one particular study, they had found within pregnant women that consuming just two grams was helpful in improving those different factors, the sleep quality, the subjective sleep quality, and the sleep duration. When we look at it from a research standpoint more globally, when we're talking about um, managing PCOS and improving insulin sensitivity, the dosages for that are going to be higher. And so in that setting, maybe you're a a individual who is dealing with a little bit of insulin sensitivity and you're also currently pregnant and wanting to see improvements in your sleep. Uh, supplementing with four to five grams is not going to be a bad thing and you're not going to have overconsumption. So I would say being at the two to four gram marker within the myoinositol would be a, a good place. Um, also, when you look at, there's there's a singular form of inositol and then myoinositol is a a better form of it. So the dosages when just looking at inositol is going to be significantly higher. I want to say, I didn't, I didn't put this in the notes, but I want to say it's like 14 to 16 grams per se. And so the difference is there. I would highly recommend myoinositol over inositol for absorption reasons. And so those are the dosages that we would recommend there. Now, some vitamins to be mindful of throughout the day. These are not these are not vitamins that um, are you know, necessary for you to take before bed. It's not going to be a bad thing that you take them before bed, I don't think, um, but are important for you to pay attention to. So uh, vitamin C. Vitamin C is going to be um, obviously very important from a, a day-to-day perspective. You're going to get a lot of this through your diet. I don't think that it's overly necessary to supplement with um, unless you were to go in and um, see low levels within your blood. Um, but vitamin C having low levels does are individuals who have low levels experience uh, disturbances within their sleep. So they're having what feels like very light sleep and then waking and then very light sleep and then waking. It's very annoying. I know that probably you as the listener are mm-hmm. like, yep, experienced that before. <laughs> uh, it could have been the vitamin C I you know, possibility for yeah. sure, but there's other factors that obviously play a role. There. And with vitamin C also taking it before bed, because I know you might've heard before of you should only take it in the morning of it can help 
help you clear cortisol at night. So it can be helpful for that when it comes to being able to wind down for bedtime. If you are a bikini competitor who has competed well at the regional stage or at the national stage and not placed how you wanted, I would love the opportunity to work with you. If you would inquire via the link in the description box, that would be the first step. And from there, we'll get a call scheduled and I look forward to speaking with you. Absolutely. Vitamin D is the next one. Now, vitamin D, it feels like in supplementation, the two things that you should just should just supplement with, it's just best for you in general, is going to be magnesium and then vitamin D. Hey, we'll throw in a third and we'll make a YouTube video about it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> or it already exists. I'm not sure. Yeah, truthfully, if you are looking at the three health supplements that we highly recommend you take, go ahead and head over to the Physique Development YouTube. And there's a video that Miguel absolutely crushed putting together um, talking about the supplements and why we recommend them. So vitamin D has been linked to maintaining quality of sleep. 70% of Americans get less than the recommended amount of vitamin D. And now... You may be an individual like us. We're in Ohio. I mean, we just came off of a week of zero sunlight. It was literally gloom and doom it was, every day. It was pitch black from sun up. Well, <laughs> in theory, sun up to sundown. It was pitch black gray, then yeah. pitch black again. <laughs> it just wasn't a good week to try and go out and get some natural vitamin D. <laughs> and so if you're like us and you're in the Midwest during those winter months, I highly, highly, highly encourage uh, supplementing with vitamin D. And the third vitamin that I wanted to make a, a point of is vitamin B12. Now with vitamin B12, it has has been shown to, if, if, if you have lower levels of vitamin B12, that you are experiencing shorter durations of sleep. And I cannot explain a more annoying feeling than going to sleep, waking up, thinking like, it is time to start the day. You look at the clock and it says 2 a.m. <laughs> and you're like, I thought this was, it was going to be 6 a.m. Yeah. I thought it was time for me to start my day. Even worse, you get up, don't even look at the clock. You're so fired up that you're ready to go. <laughs> you go shower, you get dressed, you look over finally for the first time at the clock. It's 2.30. Yeah. And you're like, ah, well, because that's happened to me. I've done that before. Um, I've made that mistake where I'm trying to avoid looking at my phone or looking at the clock because I'm like, I do not want to associate at <laughs> all with any light whatsoever than the sunlight because everyone says that I should do that. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's it backfired. Yes. And I wanted to talk about vitamin D just a little bit more. So when we talked about melatonin, one thing that we didn't specifically say is that it is going to be very sensitive to light exposure and light can suppress melatonin synthesis. Um, but it's also going to be extremely helpful to have like morning and waking light exposure like we talked about in the last episode of how important it is to get out in the sun. Um, but Alex, uh, even just the other night had something come up when it came to just light exposure and in, in general within talking about like screens and those aspects oh, yeah. before bed just the other night. Yeah. Um, so I have had the same pair of glasses for a long time. I've, I've, I beat the shit out of them. They, I've, I've fallen Apparently asleep in them. Apparently it's my bad influence. Yeah, uh, they, it is. I, I never did this before Sue and I met. Um, <laughs> and you know, the, the, what are these? The ears? Not the ears. <laughs> the ears? What is it? What are the sides? <laughs> Not ears. What are they? I mean, Whatever, if you guys are watching on YouTube, <laughs> leave it in the comments of whatever this part of the glasses is. But in that pair, maybe the arm more than the ear. I mean, they're on my ears. <laughs> anyway, in that other pair, they're super bent. They're, they're, it's just a mess. Okay. And that pair does not have blue light blocking on the glasses. I've got new glasses. You guys maybe have, have seen them in a couple of videos here. I've got this new pair, I love them. And they they have blue light blocking. And at the beginning, it was kind of making, it would give me a little bit of a headache, I feel like, just because it was kind of changing how things looked. But I've, I've, uh, um, I've acclimated to it. I've, you know, all that stuff. And so uh, I've been wearing these more consistently. And uh, whatever night it was, we were watching TV and uh, I thought that I was going to fall asleep. So I took these off because I want to take good care of these. I don't want to treat them like I did my last mm -hmm. pair. This is a better pair. I promise I'm going to treat <laughs> them better. And uh, so I took 
these off and put the other ones on and we just continue to watch the movie. And I felt a dramatic change in my sleepiness because of that blue light exposure. And so that's just one thing to be very mindful of if you are consuming uh, TV shows, movies, what have you before bed, being very cognizant of what that light exposure is doing for you and and making sure that it's not um, overly excitatory or the screen is extremely bright or you have the blue light blocking on the, I know that some TVs now have the blue light blocking like on the screen. Um, or you have blue light blocking glasses on, that will be a tremendous help. Yeah. And the other thing I wanted to talk about when it comes to vitamin D, which we've said of just, it's been very gloomy here and we're not getting sun and we're getting out like outside every day. But the sun exposure, I mean, on a cloudy day, you basically are having to double the time that you're outside to get the same benefit. And since it's also cold outside. I'm not trying to just stand outside for hours and hours on end. And so we've bumped up our vitamin D um, temporarily just because it is so gloomy. And a big part I wanted to say about vitamin D is not only that it is going to affect, like we talked about magnesium, but it also is going to play a role when it comes to your thyroid as well as your testosterone levels. And this can also affect your sleep. And so being able to make sure your testosterone's in a good place and your thyroid is in a good place is only going to allow your body to function a little bit more optimally. Um, but on the same vein of being in the Midwest, and we also talked about shift workers a little bit earlier, um, I have a client and she just crushes it day in and day out and she's been killing it. And recently just been struggling with her mood be, being going up and down. And we knew that she was on night shift. We actually got labs just a little bit ago. We got vitamin D in place and we were in a good spot. And it just felt like her mood was not stabilizing and we didn't know what was going on. And we looked at the hormonal side. We made sure that was in a good spot. And then it clicked when she said in a check-in of like, I don't see the sun throughout the day. And it threw me for a loop because we were supplementing with vitamin D and I understood that she was on night shift. And we've talked about it at length, but her check-in pictures, it's always natural light, and a lot of her gym videos are always natural light. So I was thinking, yes, she's on night shift, and she has night shift three times a week, but she's likely getting out in the sun outside of that. And she expressed like, hey, and especially if I'm going to back-to-back -back night shifts, I might not see the sun for multiple days. And it was like, oh, we need to get that vitamin D up, 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 because you're not getting that exposure. And and so if you are in a situation like that and you're having a hard time, that might be the answer of being able to get in some more vitamin D temporarily um, or on the days that you have night shift or even looking into something like red light therapy, which again, the research is still expanding on red light therapy, but it is something that we have start to see some studies come out when it comes to like seasonal affective, or, uh, seasonal affective disorder of dealing with depression, especially when you're not seeing as much sun, vitamin D and red light therapy are things things that we recommend to clients. So now you may be thinking, all right, you guys convinced me. I've, I need to get some of these supplements into my life. I've been struggling with my sleep. What is the next thing for me to do? Now, we will recommend that you only grab one of these. And that is why we didn't come on here and, and have a, a sales pitch for one of the companies that we work with of you should buy this direct product because with both of our companies, they uh, they sell a sleep product that is going to be kind of an all-inclusive. It's going to have multiple different ingredients and that is going to obviously be helpful, but we want you to have the opportunity to pinpoint what's really going to be helpful for you, saving you as much money as possible so that you're not just... Um, you know, throwing everything at the wall and being like, well, something worked in this, so I'm just going to keep taking all of it. And where, you know, some of these supplements, such as something like theanine, what, $20? Mm -hmm. $20 for like 60 caps for 200 milligrams. And so uh, you could have, you know, $10 a month relative to potentially buying a sleep supplement that's going to be, let's say, $50 a month um, that has multiple things. It's working very, very well, but you're not exactly sure what you're really benefiting from. And so what we recommend is grabbing one, maybe two of, of the things that we talked about today day and giving yourself about a week of utilizing them. 
see how your sleep uh, improves. Try not to change a whole lot within your uh, dietary intake. Try not to change a whole lot within your training. Try to just live your live your life and, and go about your day just as you normally would so that you can really see what's benefiting you. Because I, I know that for myself, I've, I've been a supplement lover for a very long time. <laughs> From a very early age, I've, I've always wanted to just get that 1% extra better. And with that being the case, I've gone through many spurts where I've listened to episodes just like this and been like, hell yeah, give me the links. Add to car. Yeah. Get, get, open up the Amazon. Let's get it rolling. I want to spend $200 to $300 on all these products because <laughs> I know these are going to be helpful for me. And I've walked away with um, you know improved knowledge, but not necessarily knowing exactly from from that massive stack of supplements I added in, what's really benefiting me. And so I really encourage just taking one or two, assessing how things have gone, and then going from there. Yeah. And like within also looking at the last episode of episode 97, if there's a lot of aspects in that that you aren't nailing down, I would recommend focusing on those before focusing on a supplement. Unless it's in a situation where I don't like to use supplements for Band-Aids, but if it does give someone temporary relief to kind of kickstart things to move forward, then I'm okay with that. So if someone's massively struggling with sleep and they're working on the lifestyle factors, they're actively working on them. We're not just throwing caution to the wind and like we need sleep to be in a better spot ASAP, then I'm like, all right, let's go ahead and add in just one or two things here to get you in a better spot to then overall get things moving forward. And again, since you noticed a big portion of these weren't necessarily sedatives that you can take them outside of it and things like magnesium specifically, that's something we recommend to have throughout the day for our clients. And then it can also help with sleep. So that's something that I would feel confident and comfortable telling someone someone to go ahead and pick up because I know there's going to be benefit to them having it. And especially within recommending supplements, we could go down a very slippery slope of just talking supplements. And like Alex said, he's been a supplement lover for a long time. He could go into that rabbit hole. But we've always tried to be aware of like there is a a certain level of awareness we have to have of how someone is going to take that information. And the more that we can make things very clear, but also being able to recommend things that are going to be helpful, but there's not going to be as many downsides, we want to be aware of that, of how it can apply to the situation as a whole. But you also need to do the work of really listening to this and seeing, again, which one based on the description, the understanding of it, the side effects is going to be the best for me. And we don't have that answer because we don't know your life and your situation. So again, don't just take this and run with it and add all to cart, but really being able to think about how it applies to you and your situation. A common question that we get from clients when implementing these supplements and they see improvements in their sleep is that they get a, a small concern of, am I going to be dependent on this supplement for the rest of my life? Am I going to have to take these supplements to have this level of sleep for the rest of forever? And the beautiful thing is no, that is a an, an awesome aspect. And this is going to um, be a part of, of the... Uh, the neural aspect and the neural plasticity. And I want to kind of give an analogy that is going to allow for uh, this to be the most digestible. And so when you are in a situation that you are needing resources, you have a friend, we're going to call that friend, whatever the supplement is, that friend has the resources that you're needing to improve said sleep. That friend is going to get you connected to the individuals that are going to improve that sleep. And so you're going to be able to have that bond or that neural connection uh, with that other individual to be able to improve your overall sleep. And you're going to continue to supplement with it. You're going to continue to supplement with it. But that neural plasticity is improving that communication between those neurons and through the brain to allow for your sleep to greatly improve. And so when that friend is, is not around being the supplement, are you not going to have the communication and friendship that you were able to develop with those other components or those other individuals because that person is not around? The answer is no. Now, could you go potentially an extended period of time and maybe the placebo component is playing a role? 
Probably. I think mm-hmm. that there's a, a an aspect to that. But what we're doing within the supplementation is that it's p- improving the communication in the brain to allow for you to be in a more relaxed and improved sleep state to fall asleep as well as maintaining that sleep. And so I think that does that was that a good yeah. analogy for that? Okay. So I, I think that that allows for those dots to really connect. Mm-hmm. And understanding that the dependency isn't going to be created, but it's more so that you may have, like after time of utilizing it, you may have seasons of life where maybe the glycine stores that you have are low because some of these things are going to have buildups in the body, such as magnesium. And so you may have times where it's a little bit lower and you need to supplement again type situation. So having these things in is not going to be a lifetime dependency for your sleep to stay in a good spot. And I just wanted to make that very clear. Yeah. But especially the ones that you can get from food, go ahead and think about something like protein that doesn't have a storage um, system in the body, like carbs and fats do, but protein doesn't. And so you do have to consume protein every day to get the benefit of it. Some of these are vitamins and minerals or naturally occurring within food. And so looking at your food and thinking, if I'm not eating this every day, I might need to be able to have that supplement in place um, to make sure that I'm getting what I need to out of this. And that is your supplementation for quality sleep. Quality sleep. Quality Quality sleep. (laughs) (laughs) I hope you guys got a lot out of this. I I felt as though that we kind of, uh, to to critique myself, I felt like I kind of rushed through things. So I don't think so. You don't think so? No. Um, If you guys felt as though that you would like things to be more expanded on, I'm more than willing to do that. Please um, leave us a review if you're listening to this um, on Apple, Spotify, whatever the platform may be. If you're on YouTube, go ahead and leave us a comment, leave us a like, subscribe to the channel. We are, we so appreciate you. Um, and I hope you have a beautiful day. Yeah. Have a good one and a good night of sleep.